Today's episode of Adventures Through the Mind is an exploratory interview with Sky Otter. By this I mean that Sky and I entered in with a general sense of topic, but an all but completely undetermined sense of what we would talk about once we were in the interview. We knew where we would start and that we would end when the interview was over, but everything else you hear in today's interview emerged from a spontaneous navigation through topics based solely on a known starting position, curiosity, and the intimation of feeling of something meaning something of value guiding us out to waters unknown and back, from conversational departure to birth. Throughout the interview, led by the inspiration of a cephalopod now extinct for over 66 million years, we explore what it means to live our lives in alignment with life, creatively, and with heartbreak, grief, endings, and death as not only necessary parts of the process, but as gifts that can deepen, enrich, and guide our limited days. Some of the topics we explore include ammonite as an example of death and creative change in evolution, why life requires death and heartbreak is necessary, finding our way out of mass extinction through creativity and service to life, building heartful community in relationship with nature, deep time and the ever-present isness of all things from all time, and why acting in alignment with life is a gift to all life across all time. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Adventures Through the Mind. I'm your host, as always, James W. Gesso. As you heard at the opening there, our interview today is with Sky Otter. And here's his bio. Sky Otter, formerly known as Bill Pfeiffer, is the founder of Sacred Earth Network, which implemented leading-edge visions for over 25 years. In that time, Sky made Russia a second home, having traveled there 44 times, assisting the environmental and indigenous movements through the Sacred Earth Network. He has also led hundreds of spiritual ecology workshops, including men's and breathwork, and has undergone extensive training with Siberian shamans. He has also spent much time in the U.S. Southwest learning about native medicine ways and the crucial importance of the petroglyphs and pictographs. His book, Wild Earth, Wild Soul, A Manual for Ecstatic Culture, has been met with high acclaim. So Sky has actually been on the podcast twice now. Uh, once was in a dedicated interview back for episode 156, titled Deep Ecology, Earth Connection, and the Circle of Life. And he was also on episode nine of our mini series here on the podcast titled uh, Psychedelic Cafe. The title of that particular cafe is Why Our Sense of Connection Matters. I will include links to uh, these other two episodes that uh, Sky has been on in the description to this episode, wherever you're checking it out, as well as in the show notes to this episode at jameswgesso.com. And very shortly, we're going to jump straight into the interview. But before we do, I just want to give a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon who make this podcast possible. Without their decision to voluntarily become a part of the Patreon community that supports this show financially, I would not be able to continue giving the time and energy to producing this podcast and all that goes along with it, and in particular right now, the ability to continue working on my new book. So thank you so much. I couldn't be doing this without you. And I deeply appreciate it, especially so many of you have stuck around through what has been a very difficult couple years in my life since my head injury in 2022. So I say it every episode, but I mean it the same every time, and that is with a deep earnestness. Thank you. The people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube or in the description to this episode, wherever you're checking it out, are people who give substantially, some of which for a very long time, and their name in the credits is an extra special thank you for that. If you find value in this show and you'd like to reciprocate that value in some way, you become you could become a patron on Patreon by signing up for a financial uh, pledge once a month uh, towards the show. 
as little as two to four dollars really does go somewhere. It all adds up. But of course, there are other options for more than that. If you're interested, you could also leave a one time PayPal donation or purchase something from one of the affiliates I have a relationship with or something from the online shop, such as the new limited edition postcards I produced or some digital lectures, so on and so forth. Lots of opportunities to uh, financially involve yourself in the support of this show. So thanks for following. Thanks for signing up for Patreon if that's what you're into or leaving a donation. And uh, without much further ado, here is my interview with Sky Otter on episode 186 of Adventures Through the Mind. Enjoy. Great. Oh, okay. Trying to move out of uh, tech tech management mode and into interviewer mode, or I guess uh, something like an interview mode. Um, given that today's episode is going to be a little bit different, I guess we're in it now, uh, a little bit different than the normal, uh, which is, first off, Sky Otter, welcome back uh, to Adventures Through the Mind. It's a pleasure. And I hear you about moving from kind of tech busy mind preparation um, into this this very uh, powerful moment right here and now. And uh, I want to invite you and who is ever listening to just take a deep breath. The breath of life. Mm. It's a. Um... It brings to mind uh, I, I did for a little while uh, a meditation app called called Waking Up, and uh, eventually, you know, somewhere along the thirty day course of learning mindfulness meditation, the instructor gets to a point where they tell you to just like you now instantaneously, like in a single breath, drop into your awareness of being an entire cloud of sensation where multiple. Uh, multiple sessions are slowly building your capacity to touch that and at some point it's like okay now just drop right in like immediately start that's where we are and uh being able to just instantaneously drop into the moment very difficult but i feel like we're here now yeah we are and it's uh it's really um it, this i'm just very very encouraged when i hear about you and other people taking the spiritual path seriously. Um, you know, that's a big other conversation, but uh, my, my life experience is, is that kind of when you, you put in the, the hours and the sincerity, you get it back in spades, and it, it, it comes back in grace when you least expect it. Mm. I like that. So just a moment ago, I had mentioned that this is not a typical style of interview, and that's because uh, typically I would have a, you know, a relatively thorough sense of of the content that you know I intend to explore in an interview, and have styled and prepared questions that showcase, um, you know, not with not with too much rigidity, um, lots of room to breathe, <laughs> breath of life in there, lots of opportunity for the conversation to be alive. Um, but generally, it's pretty well, pretty well sort of prepared in advance. The difference in this interview is that in a, you know, recent conversation between you and I, it had come up that you were interested in bringing a topic to the show to having a conversation about something that I don't really know that much about. I don't and don't even entirely know <laughs> what it is that we're going to talk about today other than it having something to do with cephalopods, ammonite and uh life's capacity to thrive um under great duress. Um so with that the interview I guess is going to start off with you basically giving us a baseline like what are what are we here to talk about today? Sky well, first of all, James, I'm uh, <laughs> I'm kind of so excited about this angle for this discussion that came up. Uh, it, we were getting off of our last call, and all of a sudden, I I kind of got this download of what I wanted to to say uh, that seemed new and fresh, and added on 
added on to the the work I've done before. And so kind of with no further ado, I'm just going to say, check this out. Okay, so this is unbelievably about 180 million years old. Now, that, now, pardon me, to clarify for the people who are listening on audio, you just held something up uh, to the video feed. Can you describe a little bit what you held up um, yeah. before you give the context of it? For sure. Uh, so it's uh, roughly a, a four-inch, five-inch ammonite uh, that a friend gave to me uh, a long time ago. I don't even remember when. And so when you and I got off that call, um, it just, it almost spoke to me, like, you have to talk about me, this, this Ammonite from this, this distant ancestor, our distant ancestor, and the capacity for, um, expanding into deep time as a way of expanding our present capacity to um yeah be our best uh be a, be be our most resilient and strongest wisest most beautiful selves our most shining selves as we um you know we're always in this in this powerful present and so you know that the, the whole issue of time is always a a very fluid one, but the the thing that I just got so excited about is that I was just feeling this um, beautiful ammonite. I'm just going to put it up to the screen one more time, and and I was feeling the the um, not only that power of 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 the vitality and. You know, it went by the way of the dinosaurs. They both went at the same time. Um, and, the, and the ammonites were actually food for some of those marine dinosaurs. And they just vanished with that, you know, ostensibly this, the science says 65 million years ago, boom, so many species lost. And, and this kind of um, almost sadness that I had experienced when I was a child, when I first f found out about the demise of the dinosaurs, and then finding out about the demise of the Ammonites, the sadness then led to this, <laughs> like, <laughs> just this sense of, but oh my God, we're here now, we're alive, we have this capacity to feel uh, and to to know things in a way that maybe no other humans have ever known before. And so there's something about this Ammonite, which is also, um, I believe, in the class of cephalopods. So it's like a freaking um, squid or octopus that, was that kept on going, but not in the ammonite form, but the form, the, the form evolved and changed. Um, and, um, you know, it's, I'm not an evolutionary biologist and I don't know this subject inside and out, but for all those, you know, scientific oriented people out there and science teachers, it's like getting their students to feel like, what we're the progeny of what who we are like what is what this millions and millions of year old journey of life creating new forms in new in new ways and actually increasing the amount of biodiversity and here's the main point james is that each one of those um each one of those changes was a creative change and adaptation. So even though one form may die, there's something that is transcendent about 
what happens next. And you just see the you see the biological record of how it just keeps getting like more and more and more compl- complex. And so I, I guess I draw great strength and hope in looking at deep time, looking at the evolutionary record. And if it wasn't for, let's say all my deep ecology and shamanic training, it could all just look like a bunch of sort of dry science and, you know, academic formality or even just kind of superficial, uh, a superficial like, oh, isn't that interesting, like an intellectual experiment. But when we got off the call, I never the, our last call, I never I never felt the kind of reality of our distant ancestors you know, in a sense, calling out sort of like if you stick with life, if you align with life, if you really like put aside, you know, just your personal concerns and kind of jump into the fray at your most creative and powerful, you know, level, all kinds of crazy miracles can happen, Uh, you know, and and as I'm listening to myself speak, It's like, I don't, I have no idea, like no one knows where it's all headed, but I do know that, 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 that when we're feeling the power of life, when we're feeling aligned with life in whatever way, you know, however one defines that, um, we're just, it just feels great and we 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 shine and we um yeah we're 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 leaving something behind us as a form um you know a hundred years is like a pretty long human lifetime two hundred thousand years homo sapiens and then this this baby, a hundred and eighty million years old, and so yeah, it's it's not here, and nor will this body called sky otter won't be here. But it's this sense of when we're aligning into this, you know, the greater creative life force. Um, that's that's where the miracles happen. So that's kind of a, you know, a a, a kind a, a summation of what was happening for me and how I couldn't, uh, I didn't know what what I was going to say to you at the time. I did a little research and there's one last thing, James, which is that um, I looked into this, you know, where did the, where did the, uh, the mollusks, the cephalopods end up? And, you know, I looked at, at the, the trailer for my octopus teacher and I was just so moved. And I think that from what I can see from the trailer, he's really, um, he's talking about exactly what I'm talking about just in a different way. And, uh, and, and amazingly, he's up close with this octopus in the most extraordinary way. Have you seen it? I have not. I've seen the trailer. I've not seen yeah. the uh, documentary, although my partner is very excited about it. It's on our list. So uh, this might be the nudge we need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nudge, nudge. Yeah. So it, if I'm getting, if I'm getting, you know, at least some, some piece of what you're, what you're sharing here, you're kind of speaking to this moment of, of feeling in like lived connection. When you say we, you mean sort of like we, the royal we of like the many different iterations of species that have come through throughout the evolution of life on planet earth and when you talk about connecting with uh with the sort of like old or deep deep time is sort of connecting with having having sort of a, a sense of experiencing how far back those you know quote family connections go that ancestry connection go and you're you're speaking to the ammonite as a kind of like almost like a, I mean, a totem really objectifies it, but yeah, yeah. A keystone keystone that, um, that, that has you really, really sort of feeling into not just how life 
continues, like the survivors, but also how expressions of life end and life still survives. Life still continues in different iterations over over long periods of time. And your mention of um you know, the Ammonite being from the era of the dinosaurs, the dinosaurs and their ending is part of one of the great mass extinctions that we know have happened on planet Earth. I mean, take take what I'm about to say, go in any direction you like, but I'm wondering if part of why that feels especially felt especially relevant to you um, is because of, of the sort of mass extinction we're report, reportedly in right now. And, and if so, you know, why? Like, what's the meaning of that for you? Yeah, well, that's a, that's exactly it. So um, I've been feeling the mass extinction for quite some time, and so the so the question that I've kind of been asking myself all along for forty forty five years is, okay, what is my creative response what is the most creative thing i can be doing right now but it's not so you know it's not, it's not such a cement question it's it's sort of off in the background i feel this greater thing happening on planet earth cuz i'm very much a part of it as in the destruction of thousands uh, millions of species many many times faster than the kind of rebound rate um and so uh for new species and so i guess i guess james it's like the kind of the central theme of of um of talking to you is so on one uh today on one hand it's this uh, strength of the alignment with life and then the um, wanting to stimulate in myself and other people this this dazzling creativity that we're capable of and just knowing about the spiral of the DNA and spiral galaxies all of these things point to me that the way out of the mass extinction in terms of in terms of from the point of view of life best possible outcomes are by using our creative potential and as we know usually our creativity uh, you know, it, we we don't really rise to the occasion until we're back, back our 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 back is up against the wall. But instead of it being this sort of super frightening, like ah, what's going to happen? The world is going to end, or anything like that. It's more of like, again, like can you believe this ancestor, this Ammonite, and 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 the multitude of other species that in that very realistically, James, have made our current life possible. We could not be speaking to each other without these ancestors. So it's drawing their, yeah, this is a good way to put it. It's drawing their ecstatic life experience through pain and pleasure to to live fully now. And, you know, I realize that I'm, biting off a lot at the moment but the, but but I'm hoping that 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 I've just felt it so much over the last few months that sense of I'm in service to life that's where the juice is and um and I have all of this support in my, in my this this ancestral support and um I'm working on working on behalf of my descendants and I'm having a fabulous time. It's not like I'm in this super fear place about ye gods, what might happen. And sure, 
all sorts of awful things can happen. But I, I think I'm really wanting to bring to the conversation, as I have for quite some time, just the sense of this can be a fabulously joyful, interesting, and creative ride. Hmm. So I have a question about what you mean by creativity, I suppose, because it's so, you know, I mean, even myself, I feel like I have a deeper sense of it. And at first pass, what I think about it's like, you know, part of me, but like crayons, <laughs> you know, like yeah. uh, pe pencil crowns or, or, you know, markers, um, and then increase in uh, complexity from there. But I want to I want to table that for a second because uh, you're talking about this ammonite, right? Like, or you know, as a as an emblem, uh, like a keystone to represent sort of a larger family tree over a greater period of time than humans generally can conceive of. I think fully, at least in a baseline state of consciousness. And you're talking about the sort of like being in the you know kind of our, our being alive now is a is is a is a heritage that was passed on to us through this life that came before us and these ancestors that came before us and yet in order for someone or something to be an ancestor two things have to happen from what i understand one they have to die <laughs> yeah you know and two we have to choose to claim them after they're gone mm -hmm. um and so as you're speaking about this around like the sort of like the ecstatic life experiences, what struck me was also like, and they died, right? Like the Ammonite entirely died out. Now, mind you, other species in similar families that might be evolutions of the Ammonite survived through and evolved around um, this extinction event. But a part of a part of creating the sort of the medium that would become the life that we're able to experience now you know, part part of the necessity of, of generating that medium was their ceasing to exist in that form. And in many respects, like all life requires death. You know, there is no soil without things dying. Um, and I could, could only imagine how worse off we would be if the people that have been in power for the last, uh, say, 100, <laughs> 150 years, 200 years didn't die out eventually. Um, but what's, what's your thoughts on that? I think that's really, really beautiful, James. And I think that, you know, the the fear, it's natural for any, uh, indivi any individual to be terrified of dying on some level, like we're programmed to stay alive for as long as possible. So um, fear comes up around survival and in taking the perspective that you just took, you, you just took, there's two things going on, which is what I what I was talking about before, which is a kind of sadness, like, oh, you know, this is just such a, you know, that person or that Ammonite or that whatever was so beautiful. And now its form is no longer in the visible seen world. And so there's this almost natural heartbreak around it and 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 i think you know anybody who has lost a loved one knows exactly what i'm talking about and that's probably everybody who's listening um you know it hurts and then the other part of what i love about what you said is that it's like we start to learn that death is not the great bugaboo, the end of anything, and that in, in, that in actuality, there is no such thing. There's death of forms, which is a temporary phase change, uh, you know, where we just, it comes in and out of this, yeah, in, in and out of this, I, I mean, the phrase that came to me to mind was the world of appearances, but there's something much, much deeper and stronger that is giving rise to all of these forms. And so that's life, that's spirit, whatever you want to call it. And when we line up with that, it um, uh, it makes our crayons go wild on the paper. Hmm. I think, uh, I mean, 
I don't think you are inferring this, but it might be might accidentally be inferable um, and, and sort of warrants discussion, which is like, you know, you talked about there being sadness for the sort of death of forms. Yeah. You know, endings are real. You know, yeah. there's such a thing as too late. That's I've heard Stephen Jenkins and a person I follow say something like, "That's grown up shit." <laughs> like, you know that that uh, there's such a thing as too late, and that when I hear you speak to this sadness, and then I also hear you speak to this like, and there's this other part of life, and these are all just iterations of form, and this other like life itself continues. There might be a there might be an opportunity to. And, and you know, correct me if I'm misunderstanding you, but there might be an opportunity for people to, you know, think that that means one side is of of greater truth than the other, and that if you embrace life, then it's all just joy and pleasure. <laughs> but from what I understand, it's like, and also like that sadness is warranted. That sadness is a part of life you know it go it, it's not any less real how devastating it is to like have an entire form of life collapse like when i think about for example salamanders they are so beautiful to me and so small and so precious and live in these tiny little incredibly vulnerable niches and on some level there, I imagine, part of me, not a lot of people are going to notice that the salamanders are gone once they're gone. Mind you, they might notice the cascading ecological consequences, but <laughs> you know, um, but they won't notice it. And and when I think about that, it absolutely breaks my heart because they're just this beautiful, vulnerable little creature, and this basically the arrogant blundering of humanity is threatening to wipe their like wipe them extinct to a certain degree through destroying their habitat and that i can sort of trust in life and i can be devastated by that at the same time you know and that um you know i i've also heard jenkinson say something like uh, the only um the only way to get less heartbreak is to have less heart <laughs> um, right and so the heartbreak kind of like it's a package deal with being alive and and awake to life, right? I, uh, I I could never say it that well, James. Thank you. It's beautiful. <laughs> I bet Seriously. you could, Sky. To be honest, no, it's yeah. it's it's beautiful. Um, I I I actually started to tear up thinking about the salamanders and and um, I, <laughs> I I don't. I think it was my father who took me to movies and he would start to tear up at the end of the sad parts that gave me kind of this permission as I got older that a lot of men didn't get, which is it's okay to really cry. So I, you know, I cry at just about anything. And so why am I saying this? Because it it's yes, exactly. When I really, um, open up to the the devastation, the loss, whatever is happening to form life, if you will, at the life that I see and I feel, um, I um, yeah, I feel my heart break and then it opens. And so as we're talking, I realize I haven't ever suppressed that. And so it's very important for everybody on all different levels, you know, to let the river of life, to let our tears flow, to really feel that 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 heartbreak happen and not feel like, oh, yeah, we just got to be strong and line up with life and, you know, whatever. Like, I, I, I think that clarification is spot on. Yeah. I mean, easier said than done, though. There's there's the. I mean, with respect to like letting, letting the tears flow, letting the grief come in, you know, it's, I, you know, grief as like, um, grief might come naturally, but we don't grieve well by default. 
<laughs> you know, it hurts, Jake. <laughs> right? It exactly. Hurts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially as myself, like I also cry during movies. Sometimes I will cry during movies that I know that that movie was like designed to make me cry, and then I'm irritated. I'm like crying, and I'm like, these tears are cheap. You don't deserve this. Uh, you know, it's movie. Um, but other times, it's like I can feel, despite my best effort, I can feel some part of me being like, put, clamp it down clamp it down i'm like no i want it tough luck you know like it, it it gets clamped down so it's it's definitely easier easier said than done and i think requires practice and practice in community which i think is is even harder you know it's in some respect it's 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 easier to end up crying alone than it is to cry in a group and then simultaneously it can be easier to learn to cry in a group because crying alone feels so much more devastating. Um, so practice and practice in community. Yeah, I, that's the that's the segue to talking about what I love to do more than anything else is uh, uh, community building. Um, nature connecting, honoring the earth, um, living life as one process that, that uh, human, non-human, uh, joining together to draw strength from each other and all our relations, the greater body of life, and that I get so much from every single person who comes to whatever, um, you know, whatever vision quest or landscape shamanic group or wild earth intensive. And, you know, those are just titles, the, the idea of the Sangha, the Earth Dharma Sangha to change kind of definitions is like, I just live for that. It's, and we learn, you know, we can learn how to shed those tears and we get support to, to, uh, um, feel safe, uh, doing that with each other. Hmm. And to clarify, you, you mentioned these three sort of like practices, wild earth intensive, uh, something landscape shamanism yeah yeah and these are for people who maybe skip past the intro or don't know um these are intensive that you facilitate this is a part of your work in the world is to Correct. help facilitate this kind these kinds of like nature break nature based community practices exactly and that the whole beginning of our conversation is um kind of almost out of my depth, but this getting together face-to-face, um, -to -face, in person, in circle, out in the forest, um, listening to each other and the greater body of nature, you know, that's where I feel where, where my expertise is and, and what I really live for. And, 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 I, and I, you know, the, James, it's kind of like talk is cheap. It's really when we're, we're moved deeply from the heart uh, in any way that we're, you know, we see direction for change in our life. And then that, you know, that has the capacity to spread out on a larger cultural level. Hmm. I want to step back a little bit. I still want to ask you about creativity, but I want to step back around um, around. Oh, there was something that we had spoke about. Oof! Don't lose. <laughs> don't leave me now. Um, <laughs> around. Ah, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so tr trusting in life. Um, you know, as I'm I'm listening to you, I'm listening to you speak of this. I'm I'm feeling like a thread alive in me. And it's, it doesn't shy away from the pain uh, of the, you know, million species that will, are on their way to being extinct because of human activity in the world um, and whatever more 
come down the pipeline in the generations to come. Um, and there's a kind of like, there's a kind of beautiful feeling to being able to like trust that, okay, and life makes it, you know, maybe it takes another 65 million years, but regardless of what we end up doing, you know, assuming eventually we stop doing it or being able to do it, life will find a way. I think it's it's possible because I feel another part of me, it's possible to then take that language and misappropriate it to sort of glorify a kind of nihilism or like a throwing up our hands and being like, well, then it's fine, right? Like whatever, life will figure it out. Probably, you know, earth will be better off without humans anyways. And I think that that kind of like, um, I think there's a, there's a term for it, but it's kind of like ac accidentally, subconsciously, or explicitly sort of self-hating for humanity, which I think is un understandable. You know, we've, <laughs> we've done a lot of things that I think weren't quite a strong negative anti-reaction in those of us who are care about the impact we're having. Um, but I just want to like, it's a little confused now as I'm exploring the idea, but like kind of touch in on that around like the sort of that things die is necessary for life to continue doesn't mean that how and why species and whole ecosystems are presently dying at, at, at the hands of humanity predominantly is necessary or inevitable. And that it's like, that life will continue on and death is necessary for life doesn't mean that how it's presently unfolding is necessary or okay or warrants sort of like a kind of like radical allowance um, because it'll figure itself out eventually. Am I, I'm kind of like, you know, almost uh, blabbing on here, but I'm like, are you, are you, are you picking up what I'm putting down I, here? I'm totally with you. I, I think that's a real big trap and it's called numbness or that the blah, the blase nihilist uh, attitude towards life. And what that really is, is just a defense against feeling what's going on. And, and so, you know, earlier we're talking, I mean, this is my thing, feel, 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 we got to feel, uh, and with awareness. And, and so I'm with you, like, that's a trap. Uh, and, um, and it's kind of no fun. It's boring. It's sort of, uh, you don't get to play the game once you make up your mind about that. Like, you know, my sense is, and everybody has leading their own life, but it's like, you know, I guess what what I, I was actually thinking of kind of the metaphor of like, well, why not just go to the casino and just go to restaurants or just like lie on a beach somewhere? And it's like, OK, you know, who I'm not going to say that's not the right thing to do for anybody. But when I see those mushrooms behind you, they're just. um they're speaking to me about a game that just seems so much more alive and fascinating and cool. Like the, the stakes are super high, but it's like, look at the, look at what gets humans up in the morning. Uh, you know, <laughs> death defying things like, you know, <laughs> like whatever is, you know, we, we kind of thrive on, on, on excitement. And so the game of aligning with life and preserving as much, as many species for their own sake, for life's own sake, while we're here using our creativity, I love it. Don't, I mean, isn't that, it doesn't that seem like a fun game and you get to sing and dance and, you know, make art and, just like have a great time in the process. Like you don't have to like either numb out or, or just be angry and scared all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and my, I mean, this is me speaking personally and maybe I'm trying to like self justify or self soothe or something. It doesn't mean that you can't 
just like numb out sometimes either um because it, it i don't think it serves anyone or anything to push ourselves so hard and for so long that we become incapable of even caring for ourselves let alone being in service to life and at some point you know being in service to life might mean taking some time to totally check out of you know take the load off for a bit i mean speaking of the mushrooms that you, that you mentioned like one of the things that uh, they regularly have brought forth for me is like, like this is this is deeply serious. This is very important. This is very real. This is very intense. But but don't take yourself too seriously. Yeah. But also relax. But also it's fine. It just is what it is. It's so much this, but it is what it is. You know. So it's like there's a kind of like, um, uh. I, I've heard the term serious play a couple of times. Ali Biner, who I Alexander Biner, who I just um, interviewed recently, he uh, he mentioned serious play, um, like it is deadly serious, but don't take yourself too seriously in it or something like that. <laughs> and I guess that's maybe that's a part of the creativity. I mean, if I if I say, well, I'm just trusting in life, but I'm using that as an excuse to be nihilistic or numb out. You know, again, I, I'm not. I'm not personally judging anyone for doing that. I have felt and will again feel irritated and angry by those types of behaviors because they're not necessarily helping. But I don't judge people because I mean this is a lot. <laughs> like, we we got a lot going on right now for anyone who's trying to trying to actually pay attention. Um, but I but to utilize the language of you know oh trusting in life and then being nihilistic and, and that is an excuse of checking out or not making an effort. That's not really trusting in life, am I right. right? Like that's that's not leaning into life. So, give me a sense of what you mean by what it is to sort of embrace life, lean into life, trust life, and how does that relate to creativity? Like, what does creativity look like in that context? Yeah, that's such a great question. Uh, at first, I want to just go back to what you're saying because I think you like I. I, you started out by saying, well, maybe sometimes I need to self-soothe a little bit. And the, and the mushroom at times says, it's deadly serious, but lighten up and don't take yourself so seriously. I yeah. love that because it's so true. And I was, I was with a, a patchy friend of mine who actually lives in Connecticut. And we, you know, we were, we met up yesterday and he was like, he was he was just basically talking about, you know, we were on a similar subject and he was like, cut them some slack. They've got a lot, you know, there's been a lot of trauma. You got to give people a lot of space and compassion. And, you know, and he was, and, and I'm like, we got to wake up, you know, like, like I, I'm like, and so what I said to him, I said, Aaron, and I'm saying it to you, James, it's like, you're the good cop and I'm the bad cop. So my bad cop is like, come on, everybody, let's get with this program. And it's a fun program. And, you know, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to sort of bury yourself in, you know, more seriously in alcohol and, and uh, yeah, other forms of, of numbing out. Uh, because, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do... Um, I authentically feel that each one of our lives really matters and what we do and think and say matters. And so I'm, I'm kind of rooting for that part of our psyche that really feels like, yeah, I want to, I want to get on Sky's kind of creative boat here. Cause it's just, uh, yeah, I mean, just to be sort of funny glib you know it's a love boat in the sense of that that um that life and love are inseparable and you know i i i guess love life creativity saying you know having that prayer of i want to line up with that i want to trust that see what happened and see what happens see what how it how it uh you know kind of changes changes my life changes how i operate uh you know in this world 
in my personal experience, it has amazing consequences. So I'm not sure if I, you know, you, you asked a big question and I took off the chunk that I, that felt like was alive at the moment. But if there's more, please, you know, go, go for it. And I appreciate all of this. It, you know, I'm learning as we converse. Oh yeah. I feel like we're, we're, what's the term like dead reckoning? Like we, ha- we have a sense that we're going, like where we're going is towards the end of the interview. Um, but h- how we're going to get there can only be determined you know, based on how, where we've come from. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, I guess maybe it's following up on a question. Maybe it's just like a statement. One of, one of the things in your book, and I think I brought this up in the, in the previous interview we did. Um, one of the things in your book, Wild Earth, Wild Soul, that's, that's the title, right? Yes. Um, was you know, what I'm remembering, I don't have the exact quote, uh, you know, in the mental Rolodex right now. <laughs> Not that most of the people listening would know what a Rolodex is if you're <laughs> <laughs> under a certain age, but um, is uh, is something like, and, and please correct me, something like, as long as the thing that you're doing feels like in your heart, like as as your expression of of love and joy and beauty in this world and it's coming from being connected with life then it is positively contributing to life and to the crisis life is in and all of this and um i actually took that quite to heart because one of the things that i've i've often you know, battled with is, and I imagine a lot of people battle, of course, there's this balance of like, well, there are these things I, I want to do. And then there are these things that I feel like I have to do because the sort of like social, socioeconomic context of a person's life requires them to do certain activities, not to like, pardon me, but like fucking die in the street. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a really extreme example, but there are these things that I, I have to do. There are these things that I want to do. And part of what I want to do is like, I want to be having a positive impact and it can be difficult to sort of like find the way to walk a path that sort of does what needs to be done and what wants to be done like what I deeply want to do while also feeling as though those actions are, you know, net positively in line of doing good in the world. And the challenge there is, is often very like left brain logical. I have to be able to see explicitly how my particular action logically links to positively bettering a situation or a scenario that I can logically conceive and calculate myself into. And that is extremely daunting because the scale of magnitude of A, life, B, my own expression of life, period, and in a context of massive exposure to information, the vast majority of which you don't know whether or not you could even trust, and in the midst of crises, that sort of like need for logical, calculatable involvement and impact is so daunting that it is itself a kind of burnout that I've 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 felt in my like like a, a heart burnout or something, leaving me to want to have less heart um, just to get away from the heartbreak of it. But when I read in your book this premise. You know, like if, if you are, if you feel deeply connected with life and the things that you, and you do things and that feel like they're an expression of that, you are contributing to sort of the, the sort of creating that net positive good. Um, even if you can't logically calculate and track exactly where or how, um, that felt very liberating for me, but it didn't remove responsibility. Um, I'm wondering if you can maybe expand a little bit on that, maybe correct what I, I got off, off, off base. Um, and then a secondary question of like, how do we know if we're in contact with life? How do we get in contact with life? Sure. 
So one of the really big revelations over the last 20, 25 years um, has been um, kind of the insubstantiality um, of thought, like a, the thinking mind is like a survival machine. And we're deeply, deeply programmed to do what you were talking to, uh, the, the sort of second part of what you were speaking about, which is I look at X, Y, Z and all these different possibilities and I choose this one based on, um, yeah, uh, based on the best logic, uh, the best thinking I can bring to, um, to, to the situation, whatever that situation is. And so what I have found in the last 20 or 25 years is like, we're not going to think our way out of this, James, because we, you know, we're speaking collectively. And I'll just say parenthetically that the more spaciousness, heart, um, awareness, consciousness, whatever you want to talk about it, to this extremely active thinking mind that I have, I know you have, most anybody who's listening to this is going to have a very active mind, that thinking is not the only game in town. And so to go back to what you were saying about creativity, one of the most creative acts we can do is to deeply return to the power of this present moment. And James, it's not even a moment when you really look deep enough, and I think psychedelics are good at showing this, we can see it, we're always in the now. And it's such a beautiful paradox to know th know on some level that we're living in this eternal now and the strength and power that comes from that. And we've got these cool ass ancestors in our past as well. And holding that together is, uh, for me, is, a, is, is very, very exciting. But the priority for me is really, really, um, Connecting with life, not as a um, kind of like almost like an like a good idea, but feeling life, heart now, um, you know, as I connect with you as my younger brother here, you know, that, you know, you're doing this beautiful, beautiful thing. You could be doing a lot of things with your time. You've chosen to do this. This is a great skill that you have. Um, and so I think going back to, you know, you, the original thing that you, you were talking about in, in, uh, explaining to the audience what you got from my book and from our conversation is like, how, how could we really live with ourselves really any other way, unless we line up with, which, with our most with our gifts, like if we're like, not that we're bad if we're not expressing our gifts, but like what what is more pleasurable on, on the level of activity than expressing our gifts as we feel them to be? You know, like I'm not a musician, I'm not a mathematician, but I have a tremendous respect just to grab two M's of the possible, you know, what, what things you can, can do. But I just realized like that outward creative expression is, is awesome. And I want that for everybody. And really embodying this present moment, um, is a very powerful act that ripples through um, the collective consciousness. I don't know how I can, you know, I, I don't know how I can prove that statement. I can just tell you, I feel the truth of it in my bones. Hmm. 
I think, um, again, you know, kind of like calling back to the, oh yeah, I trust in life and that's why I'm not making any effort at all because it's all falling apart and life will figure out its way. That's sort of like, kind of like a holding up a sign to say like, um, I'm happy while just scowling, <laughs> you know, but, right. um, uh, I think interestingly, like when I was talking about the balance of those things, I, I imagine, cause I, I have met this the people who do this. I even in my second book, the true light of darkness, I, I talked about this premise that I have the sort of divide between, uh, flailing hippies and business professional robots and like business professional robots just like buy in completely to the system and it's like money acquisition status etc um and flailing hippies do the exact opposite and they're like oh it's just all love and creativity but the reality is the flailing hippies have like are basically end up sort of like hemorrhaging off the systems that stay in line because of people who are the business professional robots and blah, 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 blah. People can read my book if they want that. I think I'm just trying to bring in the, and we could live in the present moment, do these things, but the reality is we also have to think about things, calculate things, consider our finances and our careers and, you know, like retirement, if that's a thing, how we'll earn money in the old age and all that kind of stuff. There's a trusting in life and then there's a balance there. Um, of not being irresponsible with our capacity to also be life and serve um, the sort of complexities of life in human society. Um, you feel like that's a fair statement, sort of aligns with what well, you were speaking I, I to? Think, I think that, you know, our conversation is part of a larger conversation. And so when um, Eckhart Tolle or a million uh, Dharma uh, you know, um, Buddhist teachers, um, Rupert Spira, I'm just throwing off some names of influencers on, on for me, you know, when they're talking about the power of now per se, it's not that um, we're jettisoning, jettisoning that um, grounded sense of how can I be in alignment with life if my electricity bill is, if my electric bill is being turned off? Like meaning that's not, that's not being smart in the now. So meaning this, this embodying, this doing what we need to do, but not um, flailing around in worry uh, and fear, uh, as opposed to I do just what I need to do to, let's say, pay my electric bill and make a difference in the world in terms of expressing my gift, meaning all of that happens with our embodiment of uh, this this moment. Otherwise, uh, James, we tend to do a shitty job. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as we get off our as soon as we start getting panicked and freaked out too much, uh, you know, we, we don't, we're not serving ourselves or life or, or dissociating well. from responsibility uh, through trying to so stay so far away from panic and freak out that it's just all, everything is just beauty. It's about what I want and what I like and what feels good and following my bliss and so on and so forth. I mean, I could be like revealing a bias that I have because I have many times felt taken advantage of by people who we're living that life and it was my ability to sustain a stable job and have a house and put food in my cupboards that allowed them to like come in and take it like to have all of those things and live their life while talking about how money is no problem and so on and so forth. So I think I have a little bit of trauma edge there, but there's something about like really saying that being in service to life and connecting with life in this way and active creatively doesn't disclude the sort of responsibilities, like you said, of like making sure the electricity is paid because when I, when I think about it, yeah, I'm, I I I lovingly appreciate what you had said about the work that I'm doing, and it's also my job. Like I I put a lot of time and effort in for it to be a thing that I love and I'm inspired by and I think is doing good in the world, but I also put in a lot of hours that I otherwise would not want to, even though I'm tired, even though I'm stressed, even though whatever, even though I don't always recognize is this doing good in the world i don't know but i gotta get this podcast out you know so it's like 
I also recognize that I, I have to consider too, like, okay, how do I strategize this in regards to a long-term financial plan and earn an income doing it if I want to keep doing it? And that's also a part of this too, I guess. I, I, I call it adulting up. Like those people that you were describing, they're not adults. They're, you know, kind of like, they don't sound like they're really in that flow state of spirit, which I'm just coining another phrase here. You know, the flow state of spirit is you're taking care of business, um, uh, you know, business and all of the meanings of what that means. And uh, I don't like, I don't like the capitalist system, but it's what we've got right now. So I have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to deal with it. And so, yeah, I, I mean, I'm with you. Like, we can't pretend it's not there. But at the same time, um, yeah, I it just I guess for me, I'm more the kind of person that's the, the pushes. I, I have pushed the panic button and it just sets me you know, whatever, 10, 20 steps back. Uh, and it's when I'm really relaxed and feeling love in my heart genuinely, when I'm feeling genuinely connected. You did a great, um, you know, group group podcast uh, with on that theme. When I'm feeling really connected, James, everything flows um, and and I take care of business, you know, like all those things that that go into um, a modern life. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going to pause there. I think you know what I'm talking about. And uh, I want that, you know, I, I want that for everybody. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think the listeners, I, I feel like I know what you're talking about. The listeners do too. And if they don't, hopefully we've talked around it enough that they, <laughs> they're, you know, feeling the shape of it in the dark or something. Um but uh, I want to go back a bit. And this is a little bit more esot esoteric, maybe. And I just want to hear what your thoughts are. This came to mind, maybe for the first time. So I'm, I'm not putting the, the, the James Jessup stamp of approval on this necessarily, but I want to introduce it to hear, to hear what you say. Um, you're talking about, you're mentioning like being in the present moment, like being in now. And, you know, psychedelics sort of like showing this, like we're always in now and what it's like to be in now. And you've also been talking about, you know, at least earlier on in the conversation, deep time and bringing back in the ammonite and like, oh, this thing is 100, you said 180 million years old. And like the life, life that exists now, you know, exists in direct connection to this species that stopped existing 180 million years ago. Um, and when I think about being in the present moment, this is way more uh, accessible under larger doses of psychedelics in my experience <laughs> is, and I, I've heard, you know, someone else who's been on the show, uh, Christopher Bache talk about what he calls deep time, um, in his LSD experiences is the recognition of like, if the present moment is all that is ever existent, um, the only thing that exists and all life that has come to be and ended and all life that will end so that other life can come to be is also in the present moment, then deep time is something like recognizing that in that present moment, all of existence is, right? The ammonite is right now. And like when we're, when you're talking about deep time, do I get the sense that you're connecting with the fact that right here, right now, the ammonite is, its life is, as is all the life that has risen and fallen and all the life that will rise and fall, you know, ad infinitum or whatever. James, thank you for res rescuing my ass because <laughs> when, I was, when I was talking about this at the beginning, exactly what you just said is really, um, you know, if there's one takeaway from this conversation, you just said it. Um, which is knowing what you just said, not just it's a good idea, but knowing that uh, to me has profound implications. Uh, the more of us who know what you just said is like, it's awesome. And you also not only help me with the, let's say the thesis of this conversation, 
but also with this terrible paradox, which is that in the eternal now, there's no time. So what is it about this deep time thing? But I, I, what you just said is also completely um, congruent with all of the indigenous teachings I've received, which is all, all, t- all, t- all the, t- all the future and past flow. Uh, they exist, as you said. To repeat, the Ammonite is now. Its intelligence and its power is now. It's not something that is like um, unimportant or it was important then and it's not important anymore. It's like, sure. no, it's here. It's here with us. Mm. And and I think I think I'm I'm feeling called to say this. It's like, and it's not a concept. Right? It's, it's not it's not conceptually this is the case. You know, conceptually, we can enable a discussion about it, I suppose. But I think what you're, what we're both speaking to is, it's not a concept; it is. It is. Yeah. And we can feel the truth of this when we're really connected to our our body and the energy flowing into this body mind and like when we really slow it down so that we're um, really appreciative of these, (laughs) I was going to say monstrous cognitive abilities that we have when we're really appreciative of them, but don't mistake them for the real deal. Like they're just a tiny part of this infinite intelligence that we're part of. And, uh, and it's, yeah, that's another way of saying tapping into that is just luscious. And I don't think we would be speaking to each other if it wasn't for the gift of the psychedelics who sort of whispered in our ear, like, thought you should know there's like a lot more going on here than just your your little thinking minds. Oh, well, makes me think of Dennis McKenna. Um regularly using the phrase that uh, the plants, when he goes in, they're always like, you don't know shit. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. We've been around for millions of years. You're the new kid on the block. Would you just listen a little, you know, would you, would you two leggings, would you please just listen a little bit more? You monkeys are running amok over here. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, I feel like uh, I feel a sense that we're we're coming com- coming to the we're on our way to back sh- back to shore a little bit, um, and I'm you know being that it is your sort of like it, I th- I think it's fair to say like life work what we're talking about here is sort of like the you know like the present iteration of your life work, and part of that includes you know these wild earth intenses these shamanic practices these group things this like nature based i think i I wrote down nature based practices for cultivating human thriving in relationship with nature um i don't want to lean too heavy on solutions right now um in this particular part of the question so i want to sort of start with like all right we it is in service to life to connect with life trust in life and sort of creatively act from that connection of life. And personally, I often don't feel connected with life. And I would say that most of life, air quotes, um, as I've come to understand it, is explicitly anti-connection with life. It's actually connection with uh, you know, conditioned impulse, consumerism, uh, distraction or dissociation. And, and I think Francis Weller calls it amnesia or anesthesia. Um, so I'm curious, like before the question of how do we learn how to connect with life and what it is to feel like we're connected with life, that needs to happen before we can learn to act creatively. What is your sense as to why it is that we 
wouldn't feel connected with life. Because we feel we've been uh, through our cognitive abilities that have gone astray, we think that we're separate from the rest of life. We have a, a, a delusion, a, a delusion that puts us um, in a very suffering, suffering state of not really knowing and feeling all our relations. Uh, and, you know, the, the core of the, 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 the core of the, both the Buddha Dharma and the indigenous teachings I've received, the very core of it is, um, our absolute unbroken connection with life. And so it's more, James, of finding, in my view, all means necessary, that all means possible for us to get out of our own way in the sense of um, finding the people and the resources that help us feel that unbroken connection to life, to all our relations, to real life, not capitalist bullshit. Like I'm, I, you know, I, I try not to use too much profanity because I think it actually detracts from the message, but sometimes you have to, you really just call it the way it is. And that's not life. That was something we were, you know, conditioned to believe. Uh, and so it's really important to um, um, it's important because it's it's life giving for us to um, find anything to nurture to nurture our wild soul to go to my, to go to my book. Uh, and, you know, and I, and I say this really sincerely, um, treating the next person well, whether it's the cashier or the bank teller or whoever it is, and being conscious when we're, uh, when we're seemingly not on mission, you know, we're not doing this creative act that we love to do so much, but we're just doing ordinary life, really paying it forward to the next person, I think has a tremendous rip. Again, I have no way to prove this. It just feels like at a minimum, it's it's the right thing to do and it feels great and it lessens that deep sense of isolation. Hmm. As long as it's non-transactional in the sense of like, um, and this is you know my sense, it's like if I'm being kind with you under the expectation that you're going to be kind with me or I'll receive something, like the often misunderstanding of karma, which is like, I'll do something nice now so I get something nice next week when it's like, it actually, <laughs> whatever you do now, karma is between lifetimes. So you're not going to experience the consequences of being a good person this time. Um, but there's like a kind of uh, possibility to sort of get wrapped up. And this is a very sort of capitalist way, the sort of transactionism of like the value of kindness offered is, you know, proportionate to the value of kindness received. But it isn't what I'm here. What I assume you're saying is it's not like that. It's a gift in a way to all of life. Um, as all of life iterates in the present moment interaction, simple, momentary, perhaps, you know, once only ever interaction you have with another person. And James, it's because we're given everything in the sense of um, this breath, that we, can, we have this breath. And uh, I, I, I imagine that most people who would listen to this have enough to eat. They have a roof over their head. Um, they can get around um, decent modicum of health. Like I think that that sense of leaning into I have enough, you are enough, we are, you know, there is enough in the sense of this universe is 
so full um, that leaning into that, f f the opposite of scarcity, it's abundant, not, 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 not that transactional thing you were talking about, which is just more delusion, but that sense of, oh my God, I'm just given so much here on this planet. So, you know, I can see that that person's missing their right arm and they're still working. So it's like, I'm not going to just, they're not going to just be an object on my way to getting into some future task that I, me, me, me needs to fulfill. But, um, but like noticing, having the awareness to like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm not talking about this as like a, oh, you know, like a, a, a t like a kind of a premeditated thing, just this natural impulse towards making somebody's day a little brighter, I think is, uh, I think it's part of this sea change that we're, that we're praying for here. Mm, I agree. I want to add what I think, I mean, for myself are caveats, and I think you'll probably agree with them, which is, um, uh, no gift is possible if there is not somebody willing to receive. And so I think there's a part of that which is like, yeah, you know, be willing to like offer kindness, but also be willing to receive kindness offered. And, and this is the other caveat, is to be kind with ourselves in the sense that, you know, like, I don't, need to put on a nice face and be, you know, like, I, I don't need to like be feeling good or having good feelings or exuberating like love and joy and goodness, <laughs> you know, in every interaction I have with the, with the, the person at the, at the, the checkout line, right. Um, that I can be honest with the fact that I am feeling sad or feeling low or feeling stressed or feeling run down and not feel like I need to put a smile on. Um, and I think in a sense that kind of sets us up to being able to receive the kindness of others. But I also think that, um, I mean, the extra caveat there is not to act that out such that somebody else has to be responsible for the discomfort that you're in. Um, but anyways, that's like, I feel like we could really go into the weeds there, but th those are a couple sort of thoughts that came up when I was thinking about what you were saying. Well, weeds are people too. So I'll just say that uh, what I hear you um, championing is a real kind of soothing self-compassion for those times when we are feeling deluded, when we are suffering. And so we're not going to put on a happy face when, you know, we're not trying to, this isn't about pretense. Um, right. But, but it is about cultivating that attitude of, yeah, I I am because we are in the widest sense and of leaning into, I've been given all of these, you know, unbelievable amount of gifts. I, I want to give them back in some way because it feels good. Like, and because, as I said, because on one level, it's the right thing to do, but not, again, from that sense of pretense of forcing. Um, and it feels good. And, I, you know, I think that, that I, I, uh, I think there's, there's nothing wrong with the pleasure principle. You know, it's like it's OK for us to feel good and to enjoy life, uh, not in a disassociated like hedonistic way but just in a way of like um yeah i don't know furry mammals come to mind hmm. i mean to be honest it doesn't in my mind it doesn't have to totally exclude <laughs> hedonism, hedonism either okay uh, so you know, from time I'll, to time I'll, at I'll, least uh, right i'll, I'll, I'll give <laughs> that too i'm uh trying to really strike a strike a moderation moderation uh angle here balance um, baby balance uh so let's um let's dock <laughs> i've used a couple boat metaphors here we're back to shore let's uh come what's the term like a uh, coming into birth 
um, let's birth let's birth this thing into the world by by ending it, um, letting it end. Sky, I enjoyed this call. Um, I didn't know what to expect other than something interesting, and I'm happy to know that my not expectation expectations were uh, you know well satisfied, well met. Um, and I thank you for initiating the call for what you brought here today. Um, people might be wondering, oh, I wasn't expecting this. I don't actually know who this guy person is. How do I find out more about him? He wrote a book. What what book did he write? He does practice like retreats. How do I check out his retreats? What's your answer to those people who are asking that question right now? Skyotter.org. Skyotter.org. S-K-Y-O-T-T-E-R dot O-R-G. All right. Easy peasy. Notes, uh, link to that will be in the show notes of this episode of jamesabugesso.com. Sort of a weird break from the from the dynamic of the conversation to sort of like get all podcast moderator on there, but finishing off in an authentic moment. Sky, I really appreciated this today, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, James, back at you. I mean, it's a it's a pleasure, a real a real deep pleasure to connect this way. Um, speaking about things that, um, yeah, I, 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 I believe, I believe we believe they matter. And cut. Okay. So that was all for this episode of adventures through the mind. Thank you for tuning in again. If you do find sky otter stuff, interesting head to his website, skyotter.org, which you can find in the show notes to this episode at jameswgesso.com episode 186. As I mentioned in the beginning of this show, if you'd like to be involved more directly in this podcast and the larger body of work I produce, you can become a patron on Patreon. You could do that through a financial pledge each month, or you can sign up for free if you'd like to just be uh, able to stay up to date with what I'm doing without the algorithms defining what will or will not catch and maintain your attention, which is generally not how I like to produce content. I want to reward the attention you offer to my work with something of quality and value, but I don't want to trick you into giving me that attention (laughs) and the algorithms prefer tricking. That is just what it is. Um, So yeah, you can sign up as a free member of Patreon if you'd like to uh, make sure that you're in contact in link with the content that I produce, be it free or pledged. You could also sign up for my email newsletter or join the private telegram, telegram group Um, links to all of that are in the description to this episode. And uh, that's all for now. Thanks again for tuning into this episode of Adventures of the Mind all the way to the end. And until the next one, take care.